I, I, Godfrey, your boy, Dami. Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter and issue. Touching the matter and issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Um, Honorable nominee, on behalf of the committee, I congratulate you on your nomination as a deputy minister for justice and attorney general. Let me also apologize for the mishap. Um, you are supposed to be the second, the first among the deputy attorneys general. But we had to do the finish with the energy before we come to you. I discussed that with the clerk yesterday. But in rearranging it, he made a mistake and put you first today. So you may have waited longer than you ordinarily would. So we apologize for that mix up. It's all right. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So now the practice here is that you give us a short resume of yourself. After that, we ask you questions relating to your CV. And then you tell us how you will assist your minister. Um, in his duties as the Attorney General. So start by telling us about yourself. Right. Mr. Chairman, my name is Godfrey Yaboa Dami. I was born on 5th June 1979 to parents. My dad is Achim, my mom is Bono. In accordance with the current tradition and custom, I am Bono from Wenchi, the Brown region. Mr. Chairman, I was educated at Abetsa Memorial Preparatory School in Cape Coast from 1983 to 1988. I continued with my primary education at the Commander College Practice School. I did one year there, 1988 to 1989. Mr. Chairman, between September 1989 and 1994, May, I did my O-level education at Adisade College. I returned to Adisade again in September 1994 and pursued my advanced level education. I completed in May 1996. I did my national service at a community clinic at Comenda in 1996 up to 1997. Mr. Chairman, owing to the backlog that had been created by the university strike, we were not able to gain admission to, 19, to the University of Ghana in 1997. We were admitted in 1998. So between 1997 and 1998, in order to while away time, I actually got employed in the Ghana Education Service as a teacher at the primary school in the, um, the KEA district, Commander Edna Igualfa Brim district. Then in 1998 to 2001, I pursued my Bachelor of Laws degree at the University of Ghana. I continued with the pursuit of the professional law course at the Ghana School of Law from 2001 to 2003. At the same time, I was an intern at the Legal Resources Center that was co-founded by a certain young lawyer called Mahama Yaiga in 2001 to 2003. I think now he's Honorable Mahama Yaiga. Mr. Chairman, from 2003 to 2004, I did my national service in this Honorable House. At the same time, I also did my privilege, law privilege, at the Kufa Du Co, a law firm in Accra. Around October 2004, I was admitted to pursue law, um, the practice of law at the Good Father Pen and I've been there to date. The only break was in 2006, when person to a fellowship that I won, I had to do a program, a short program at the University of Oxford from May 2006 to October 2006. I returned to my law practice. I've been engaged in uh, various aspects of law practice relating to um, advice of companies, litigation, supervision of juniors, and what have you. I've also, every now and then, been engaged in a little bit of uh, the political activity, serving on various committees of the New Patriotic Party. Then also, I've also been engaged in various sporting activity related to the Ghana Football Association and this my committee matters. Served as a vice chairman of the Ghana Football Association this my committee for about six years. 
I was also the regional chairman of the football association. This is my committee in Greater Accra for about three years. And then also I've served on various um, other committee, election committee, and what have of the Ghana football association. With the chairman in 2000, and I mean this year, I was fortunate to be nominated by His Excellency the President as Deputy Attorney General. And that is why I'm before you this morning. Very well. If there are any questions on the CV, you may ask them now. Honorable Kujet. Most grateful, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations, Mr. Godfred Yebua Dami. The communication from His Excellency the President dated 14 March 2017 to this August House has Mr. Godfrey Dami. Your CV has Mr. Godfrey Yebua Dami. We want to know if it's the same person and what we should use for our records. That is well indeed um, it's the same person. My full name is Godfrey Yebua Dami. And that is what is indicated on my CV. And I think that's what I should be known by. Thank you. Page one of your... S yeah. Sorry, Chairman. So, you want to be known officially for our public and national record as? As Godfrey Yeboadami. Thank you. And if, Mr. Chairman, I think that all along in the public matters that I've engaged in, I've always been described in that manner. Thank Godfrey you. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, uh, since the distinguished nominee is not a member of parliament. We just want to satisfy ourselves under Article 78 and Article 94 of the Constitution. Uh, we want to know if you have declared your assets, if you have paid all your taxes, if you have your tax clearance certificate, and if you are a registered voter. Such a one, leader, I'm a registered voter. I've been so for most elections since 2000. And I'm also um, I've satisfied all my tax obligations. Indeed, I have in my file my tax grant certificate. I'm also aware that the Ghana Revenue Authority had asked matter of certified to this honorable court that I've satisfied my tax obligations. Um, just that uh, members will know, <coughs> the report is with me from the National Security, the police, and uh, the Revenue Authority, and all the nominees. If there's any that there's an issue, we'll uh, suspend the vetting of the person. Um, and, and, and the last one under that, um, are you still a full-blooded Ghanaian? We have to satisfy the nationality requirement. Such a man, indeed, I am. I've never attained any nationality apart from Ghanaian. Thank you very much. Page one of your CV, you indicate that between June and October 2006, you were at the University of Oxford. You only have stated the program you offered, the program in comparative media law and policy, but you have not told us what you earned. Did you earn any certificate or diploma, or are you able to share that with the committee? That's what I did. I earned a certificate, and that is how the program was described, program in comparative law and policy, media law and policy. It was best one to a fellowship, as I indicated, from the Open Society Initiative of West Africa, and it also pressed on to a recommendation by the Media Foundation for West Africa as a result of my defense of journalists in Ghana around that time. Page two of your CV, you did speak to that earlier that you were a teacher in the KEEA district, Ghana Education Service. Uh, I'm happy to see that. But you do not tell us which school you were teaching in, or were you a staff at the education office in the district? That's what I remember the name of the village. It was Brassy. And that's what of had it actually characterized what it was about. It was just to while away time, again, um, awaiting admission to the West of Ghana. The devil finds way for the idea has. And I decided to. Um, get enrolled in Ghana Education Service. And that was how I bought my first house system. <laughs> oh, that's oh, interesting. Uh, Brass is Honorable Osmo village. 
But if you, if you come with us to page four. What did, what did you say about me? No, Honorable on, on Slavusu said Brasi is her district, her village, her ah. holy village. Oh, I so, thought I had yeah. Osei Usu's village. No, 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 not <laughs> my village is not <laughs> I don't, want, I don't want to be ruled out of order, so I, I stayed away from the chairman. <laughs> Page four of your CV, do we have your permission to uh, clean up the third entry? Uh, I think that you repeated April 2008 to February 2009, Chairman, Greater Accra Regional Football Association, Disciplinary Committee, Disciplinary Committee. We need to expand one, I assume. Sure. That is the case. I'm very sorry. Typographic error. Yeah. And just below that, you are very active in a number of organizations. We want to know if you intend to continue to hold those positions. 2009 to date, founding member and director, Alliance for Accountable Governance, AFAC. You also have 2009 to date, director, Ghana Food Aid Network. Then you have 2016 to date, director, Evergreen Forest Limited. Do you intend to continue to hold these positions, if given the nod, as Deputy Attorney General? Dr. Chairman, um, I am prohibited by the Constitution from holding office for profit, and I'm prepared to relinquish my directorship in all these um, companies. And it is my teaching at the Ghana School of Law, which I respectfully will apply to this honorable house to continue. I think that is just community service. and. It will be appropriate. Uh, Sami, uh, uh, Sami, if you don't mind, chairman, with your indulgence. Girlfriend, uh, page two of your CV, just for purpose of uh, elegance, you have decided to be verbose. When you say you read and understand law, uh, in the law firm, as you refer to your law pupilage, you understood it law. You read and understood it law. Character and discipline uh, were not matters of study for you, or you are just quoting the law. When you are undergoing pupilage, uh, the expectation is not that you just study law. Is that the case? Mr. Chairman, indeed, I indicated that I read and understood it in the law firm. Okay. And understanding in the law firm encompasses um, adoption of the proper virtues of practice and what have you. That's okay. You have also chosen to make reference to a number of cases. Are these cases that you think you stand out? or there are other cases to which you have made a contribution in the development of the law? Mr. Chairman, indeed, on presenting the CV, I was made to understand that, well, since I am an active legal practitioner, I needed to indicate certain cases of immense public importance that I had had op opportunity of conducting. And Mr. Chairman, these are only some of the cases. There may be a plethora of, of I know some. That, yes. I know some that you know. I know that you have not yes, listed. Yes, that, that, that did not even indicate. Yes, okay. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate so that. These are a few done. that I Thank thought were. Okay. Indeed, most of them are Supreme Court reported cases. About ten of them. Mr. Chairman, talking about his selected cases, I noticed that uh, he wants to remind us that he has been involved in cases with Nana Kunedu, Ajima Rollins, and Alaji Mohamed Mumuni. Uh, so the minority has taken note. <laughs> we see what you are trying to do. <laughs> but uh, on the on the last page of the of the CV, the chairman, I'm done. Just to uh, draw your attention, professional association of international experts or consultants of all graduates, we assume. So we will, uh, will with your permission, just uh, amend that accordingly. Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, Godfrey. You are an illustrious alumni of the most famous law firm in this country, Kufuadu Prempe and Co., of which I am also proud to be associated with. And so I know that you will do 
make us proud and carry on in the tradition of excellence associated with that law firm. My question relates to the last page of your CV. Your hobbies include partying. Is that a hobby you share? And I think that's a hobby you share with your minister. Would that include dancing? And did you acquire this hobby by association with Mr. Kutuampa? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think that that hobby was enhanced actually when I got to Gufari Pepe Nku by virtue of my understanding, Mr. Kutampo. But I think that for the past four years, it has been curtailed by the presence of the beautiful woman behind me, my dear wife, Dr. Joyce Nassimin. She has virtually succeeded in curtailing that hobby. And so now I do not party as often. But it's a crave that I have, so I decided to indicate it today. Very well, Honorable Helu. Thank you very much, eh, and congratulations, um, nominee. Um, I have only one question for you, and I'm happy your minister is also here. There is a lot of public concern about the intake of students into the Ghana School of Law, and. Um, some people even want to think that it, there is a deliberate effort to limit the number of people who would have access uh, to the school. There is a huge backlog of people who want to really pursue um, law. Um, what is your take on all this? What can we do uh, to ensure that people who want to uh, go to the school of law have access and also um, have uh, equal opportunities. Uh, as it is now, people in the regions may find it very difficult to have access. So what would you tell us about that? I think that is a very immense problem. Um, as a matter of fact, having, by virtue of having taught the Ghana School of Law, I've had a first hand knowledge of the problem and difficulty. And of course, that's always oh, arisen, in my view, as a result of the expansion of the LLB program. Hitherto, it used to be in the West of Ghana, which was offering LLB. And even that one was only limited to maximum 60 students. Our time, the first 40 will have LLB, then the remaining will be offered BA law. And subsequently, there was a liberalization of the program with the opening of various um, law faculties. And I think that. It's part of the problem is also due to the manner in which the legal education is regulated. Because we have those universities which are offering LLB, uh, doing so by virtue of having received accreditation to do the program. But the law profession itself is regulated by the Legal Profession Act, which stipulates that a general legal counsel shall have oversight or responsibility for legal education and what have you. And they have, as a matter of fact, delegated that function to the Board of Legal Education. Um, by virtue of its powers under the Legal Profession Act at, at 32. So you find a situation where the law school itself is fully managed by the General, general Legal Council. But the General Legal Council does not have as much control over the LLB, um, the universities which are offering LLB. And there is also a constraint in terms of fiscal space. The, as a matter until very recently, there was only one campus of the Ghana School of Law, which is the Makola campus. But now there has been an attempt to expand access to the Ghana School of Law by the opening of two more campuses. The Legon campus, which does not even have its permanent um, premises. It used to be housed in the School of Accountancy at Legon, and then they moved to Gimpa. So now they are at Gimpa. Then the Kumasi campus, which I believe is uh, being housed in the University of Science and Technology. So I think that the problem has to do, is, is statutory, and at the same time too has to do with lack of fiscal space. I understand that the Ghana School of Law has acquired a very vast expanse of land around Ligon, which tends to develop into a law village, and that will actually enhance um, fiscal space that it can use to also boost access to the Ghana School of Law. But in my view, I, I think that the problem will have to be dealt with at the base. 
instead of expanding access to the LAB program and for the LAB graduates to flood the market and then not have any access to the Ghana School of Law. It has to be dealt with at the base. And that is something that I, I, I hold divergent views from <laughs> my, my boss. She thinks that she has a different view from mine. But I think that that's actually the, the main problem. Because the access to the LAB program has to be commensurate with access to the Ghana School of Law. There's no point granting access for a person to pursue a LLB, but of laws, and then that person will become hindered in terms of his or her access to the Ghana School of Law. And again, it also has to do with, um, or it has consequences on the quality of lawyers that are being produced. But we find, with all respect, all manner of persons having the opportunity of studying for LLB, and then and later on also having the opportunity of becoming lawyers, thereby diminishing the quality of law practice in Ghana. So that is how I think the problem ought to be addressed. You deal with it in terms of how to, of restricting in a very progressive way, access to the Ghana school, to the LLB programs, and at the same time to broadening access to the Ghana School of Law. And that one, I, as I indicated, is being dealt with because of the acquisition of a piece of land at Lego on which they want to develop into a law complex and that kind of thing. So I believe that eventually, um, in assisting my boss, we we'll also try and see if we can help in the acquisition of certain funds to develop that law village complex. Um, this is a matter which I'm passionate uh, about. So I would come and you are saying that the solution should be restricting the base, those who qualify to apply to the law school. What about expanding the top. For example, why should I live, grow up at Sunyani, obtain a degree from KNUST and have to come to Accra for the law school? Why can't there be a law school in a Shento region, in Brahafu region, in Northern region, in Volta region? But the General Legal Council, rather than having a board of legal education that is in control, just being in charge of standards, it doesn't matter where you school, this is my standard. If you, I don't care where you go to school. If you meet my standard, you qualify. If you don't meet my standard, sorry, you have to deal with your school. What do you think about that? Mr. Chairman, I, in fact, I have known your views since last year when we were putting together the report to the Committee of, on Governance. Mr. Chairman, I actually offered a double-pronged solution. I hold a view that it is totally futile liberalizing access to the LLB program and empowering all kinds of, with all respect, universities to offer LLB programs. Because indeed, it has to do, it has a lot to do with even the quality of personnel in those faculties. You find the, the faculties which are offering LLB program very deficient in terms of teachers who are um, um, supervising and administering the LLB program. And it also has a, an effect on the product, products that are being turned out. So much as I agree with you that there ought to be an expansion of the facility of the Ghana School of Law, maybe with regards to even opening more campuses, one in the north, Tamale, in addition to the ones in Accra and Kumasi. Again, we must also deal with the quality of the LLB program itself and assuring that persons who have the opportunity of pursuing every program are no doubt the best. I believe that Mr. Chairman's time when was only state students who had the opportunity of offering LLB. Very much law was preserved for, 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 for the best students in the country. Well, and I that, believe that that is what ought to, ought, ought, ought That to. is true. I may be very conservative in my But well, there are people who were with me who didn't make it because they could afford it. They went abroad and came back yeah. to become lawyers in the end. So at that point, we are cutting our people who have the competence and the capacity, but because they didn't have, uh, there was low access. But that's a debate for another day. I'll, I'll allow, <laughs> allow the uh, Jama, question to uh, go on. Jama, I want to be part of the debate. <laughs> uh, and in, in joining that debate, Chairman, uh, knowing our colleague, Yes, the law, one of the respected professions of the world, and probably in our country, 
I'm minded by the two persons seated to my right that when they say learned, many of them their workings change. <laughs> <laughs> and, and therefore, therefore, there's one on your, on your therefore, right. there's one on my left too. When you say learned, then his working will change. You see, <laughs> we we want you to state. Do you appreciate that we need to demystify legal education? and probably even add medical education as a country. That in a country where you are talking of how many persons have access to a lawyer, how many persons have access to the judicial system, and appreciating uh, having worked with the Honorable Akutuan Power, I would appreciate your knack for respect of fundamental human rights. Now, don't we want to demystify legal education and don't you think that is about appropriate that probably into the future like chairman have said upper east region should have a dedicated school or any of the investors or every other region or at least in ghana you should have a minimum five clusters of law school we need to produce more quality lawyers there will still be restrictions the restrictions in those who are able to pass and those who are not able to pass but don't you share the view. I know you are conservative in your thinking, conservative with issues that you have convictions on. Shouldn't we demystify legal education? Mr. Chairman, I totally agree with you. Legal education ought to be demystified. Indeed, I was the one who made a point that a law school ought to be opened in the north. And with all respect, not Mr. Chairman. I, again, I'm just concerned about the preservation of standards. That is why I made a point about assuring that the products from the LLB program are those that reasonably would want to um, accept or admit to the pursuit of a law profession. But I agree with you that it really there has to be a because Chama, the young of man, the he wants program. me to quote him in a debate on Legon <laughs> Campus. What yeah. you said is the same thing that Chairman is saying today. When you were then a strong advocate at the law school, you said that we should open up the opportunities. <laughs> Or are you intimidated by Minister Gloria Akufu there? In yeah. one thing Minister to... Gloria actually, actually yeah. shares your view. Yeah. Minister Gloria actually uh, shares your view. Happily, <laughs> happily, you'll be assisting her. So our thinking will prevail. Thank you. Well, me, not Titus Glover, yes. Oh, friend. Congratulations. Um... I have the full confidence that you're going to discharge your duties with humility that I know you of and with that courage. My questions are two. You are currently one of the lawyers of the New Patriotic Party and you're going to serve as a Deputy Attorney General where you need to take away your political lenses. Can you share with us how fair you're going to be when it comes to the discharge of your duties as a Deputy Attorney General? That's my first question. Mr. Chairman, there's really no doubt that I've been counsel for the New Patriotic Party over the past five or so years. There's also no doubt that I've acted as counsel for various leading figures in the New Patriotic Party, the chairman inclusive, even the president himself inclusive, his essence the president, um, being one of them. Um, but Mr. Chairman, it is also relevant to note that any mention of me, with all respect, in terms of politics, has always been in, in, in respect of my law practice. So indeed, in, by virt I mean, in matters that I've been associated with as regards um, insofar as the Patriotic Party is concerned. It is mostly in relation to law practice. So it is correct to say that I've at all material times tried to cut um, a professional impression of myself and I'm also mindful of the obligation of the Attorney General under the 1992 Constitution. If I'm supposed to assist the Honorable Attorney General in the discharge of, his, or of her duties, then I'm required to be legal advisor to the government. And that is what I will be uh, enjoying to be doing. 
and indeed I undertake to discharge that duty with all professionalism. Uh, you know, humility, saying that even in matters that involve the New Patriotic Party that I have been associated with or have been ad advocated in court, I've always maintained that professional outlook. Um, the kind of lawyer who is very mindful of the role of a lawyer, the duties of a lawyer under the legal profession act and the legal profession conduct and etiquette rules and what have you. And I think I intend to maintain that. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask my brother and friend, how do you envisage the many constitutional legal reforms being proposed by the president to happen? Well, I think there, 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 are, there are quite a number of them. And I will also say that as a matter of fact, the process of constitutional reform started even before since the president um, took office. There, were, there was this constitutional review committee the commission which was set up and it came up with certain proposals and what have you and I believe that there was also a review committee and that review committee actually drew up a number of proposals that had to be urgently um, effected and but sad to say it was more or less lumped together it was a number of proposals lumped together and if I recall the view of the president on that. He thought that was actually um, not appropriate to be for all the proposals we put forward before the nation because actually it will prevent an effective scrutiny of the proposals. So it says that the president has, as a matter of fact, um, outlined quite a number of them, about three or four of them that he intends to get the approval of this honorable house to pass into law. And that relates to one, the election of the chief executives, because that will require a constitutional amendment. Um, he holds a view that in order to make the process more representative of the will of the people, in order to assure that there's a participation of the people in the election of persons who preside over them at the district level, there has to be election of the district chief executives. And that to me is a very um, radical and bold step to be taken by any president. Then, then also, he also envisages um, removing the, the inhibition of the president by way of appointment of ministers. Again, I also consider that to be a very bold initiative because the final situation in Article 78 where the, president's, the president I'm sorry, is, is, is enjoined to appoint more than half of his ministers from parliament majority of ministers from parliament. I think that with all respect, it's something that has um, a debilitating effect on the separation of powers, um, also has an adverse effect on productivity of this honorable house. The president indeed intends to strengthen the hands of this honorable court in the pursuit of its obligations under the 1992 constitution, and intends to move for an amendment of that pro pro provision. So Such an I, I Thank you. Totally support of that. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the question I think that you are overblowing the, <laughs> the question. So he says he's grateful. Let me let me advise that here. Uh, the longer your answers, the longer you stay here. So try and make yourself as precise as possible. Your your knowledge of the law is not in doubt. This is a public hearing. If there's nothing really untoward about your character, I don't think there's anybody who has doubt about your your knowledge base. So just make it as precise as possible so we save ourselves time. Yes, uh, Neil and Tim at the point. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, Godfrey. Um, I'm taking you to an area where you and I laugh most, and you know. Not too sure about that. Okay, football. <laughs> oh, very well. That's fine. You've, you've been a counsel for the Ghana Football Association, and you've also acted in advisory role on several issues, including the discipline committee and the rest. There is a pending issue which has become almost like a problem for almost everybody in this country, that uh, there is a white paper after the Jamaica Commission, but its implementation has become a problem. You, with your closeness and association with the Ghana Football Association, and today come in as Deputy Attorney General, what assurances are you going to give this country and sports lovers that the Jamaica Commission white paper will be implemented? Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it is true that aspects of the Jamaica Commission 
I decided not of a court action. I know that Mr. Kwesi and the chief filed a court suit um, hmm. challenging the enforcement of the German Fair Commission report. So I believe that that will have to be disposed of before we can actually implement or not. Because indeed, if the court decides, it, it definitely will, will, will be imperative and has to be respected by the Ghana Football Association. So if I may be respectfully permitted not to answer questions, since the German Fair Commission report itself is a subject matter of a court action, I will be happy. Chairman, I, uh, I think this, uh, we should be able to accommodate, and therefore you may not proceed further on this particular uh, matter. Uh, but uh, since my colleague still has a floor, I intend to yield it back to you. But you walk the world of constitutional reforms. Uh, contempt, contempt, both in criminal jurisprudence relative to contempt of court, contempt even in parliament, and appointment of special prosecutors, as the president have hinted. What views do you have on those aspects of reforms of the law, Hello. and for that matter, an extension to the constitution? I think I will start with the um, latter part of your question, the appointment of the special prosecutor. Now, that appointment, with all respect, as has been envisaged by the Honorable Attorney General and his assistance the President, does not involve any kind of constitutional reform. Of course, we agree that under the 1992 Constitution, the Attorney General is responsible for criminal prosecution, and as I, as in Article 88, 3 makes it so clear that all criminal proceedings shall be conducted at the suit of the attorney general. And that implies that the attorney general initiates criminal proceedings. Again, the same constitution also makes the attorney general a minister of state. So the attorney general is very much a part of the executive. And that has been a problem that the nation has had since 1960, the first republican constitution. And even in that 1960 constitution was even so um, adverse in the sense that the attorney general could only the words were clear, subject to the direction and control of the president, the attorney general shall be responsible for criminal prosecution and what have you. So even though the 1992 constitution is an improvement to the 1961, it is still um, leading with the same problem. It still makes the attorney general a very, much, very much a part of the executive. And that to me seeks to present a constraint. Uh, and to make it short, it so you share the view that the attorney general should be subject to the law and the control of the law and not the executive or the president. Is that the view you are espousing? No, what I am saying, I'm actually trying to give a rationale for the setting up of the office of, of the special prosecutor. The special prosecutor is required to undertake special prosecution, especially matters related to corruption in the public sector, as well as other offenses, abuse of public trust and, and, and public funds. And I'm saying that- There's that nothing in Ghanaian law prevent the attorney general from prosecuting on corruption. No, but the so, with all respect, um, the so monopoly of the attorney with regards to the institution of criminal proceedings and the conduct thereof actually presents a problem. Because if the attorney general is part of the executive and subject to all the frailties of the human person, clearly there can be a practical problem with regards to prosecution of criminal offenses. What is that practical problem you envisage? What yes. is that practical problem? Mr. Chairman, the practical difficulty is the ability of the attorney general. Honorable right? Odame, yes. Honorable yes. Nomini, yes. you are reminded of the caution by the chairman before he left. The more you speak, the more you open yourself up. So be brief in your answers. And since you are a deputy minister, I believe that most of these decisions will be taken by your minister, and you are in there to support. So you are guided by the, the advice by the chairman, and keep it brief. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I was actually responding to um, the questions by the honorable member. And my position with all respect is that the unique position of the attorney general as both the principal legal advisor to the government and also a minister of state presents a constraint in his or her ability to effectively prosecute members of her government. That is why the president has conceived a mechanism whereby 
you have a person who is wholly independent or reasonably independent of the executive in charge of prosecution of corruption and other related offenses. And I think that the vehicle that the president intends to um, employ is very much appropriate and it does not involve any constitutional amendment because actually, if you look at the provision, it says this, the Attorney General or any other person authorized by him may undertake prosecution. So inherent in that provision is the opportunity of a delegation. And I believe that if the Attorney General can delegate her powers with respect to prosecuting of members of, of, of the government insofar as corruption is concerned, it should be appropriate and very much constitutional. Okay, I'm not right Um, before I get to my substantive questions, the special prosecutor, will that person be appointed by the same president or as we have in parliament, you can have an arrangement where you have uh, a body like um, uh, subsidiary legislation committee which is headed by a minority minority member of uh, parliament or public accounts committee which is chaired by a minority member of parliament the reason why i ask this question is the attorney general is being appointed by the president special prosecutor appointed by the president the forces that mitigate against the partiality or otherwise of the attorney general may work against the special prosecutor if all of them are appointed by the president. Oh, Mr. Chairman, that is why I actually wanted to take time and explain this um, concept of appointment of a special prosecutor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's very necessary to draw a distinction between the appointment process and the delegation of the attorney general's powers with regards to the prosecution of criminal offenses that the special prosecutor will be seized of. And I say so because under the constitution, yes, the attorney general is supposed to undertake criminal prosecution. But again, the attorney general may do so by any other officer authorized by him. So we find a situation where the president or the attorney general may appoint a special prosecutor. And the attorney general can, through an act of parliament, delegate certain powers of prosecution with regards to certain offenses to a special prosecutor. Now, we know that, yes, under the common law and indeed under the statutes of Ghana, the attorney general was the power of knowledge, prosecutor, and what have you. That is a very powerful tool that the attorney general wrote to discontinue criminal proceedings against a person that um, um, he or she does not want to prosecute. So that power itself can also be delegated so that the special prosecutor will become seized of all the powers of the conduct of criminal prosecution. So the special prosecutor is appointed by the president under an act of parliament but has full control over the conduct of criminal proceedings in respect of offenses that he or she may prosecute. And I think that that clearly will make it not amenable to the difficulties and challenges that the honorable member is, 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 is contemplating. Because if an act of parliament is enacted and the act specifies that in respect of these offenses, the special prosecutor will be the one to investigate and if necessary, prosecute. It is not the attorney general who have conduct over the investigation and prosecution of those offenses. And the power of knowledge prosecutor is also removed from the attorney general in respect of those offenses. I believe that it cures uh, all challenges that you may have. And it's actually Very well. Well, I think the real issue is about whether if the president appoints, it will not influence or it will not still give it the political character. But we will cross the bridge when we get there. If a bill comes here, then all the experiences we have will be brought to bear in getting what we think will help the country. Robin Lander, please continue. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Nominee, in the same area, do you think that um, the legal opportunities open to aggrieved persons in football matters in this country as of now is exhaustive enough to give somebody fair judgment in cases of uh, the person, okay, not happy with any case of the GFA? I think that the statutes of the GFA will perhaps have to be looked at in terms of um, restricting 
access to court for persons aggrieved by decisions of the disciplinary committee and what have you. But of course, I also appreciate the difficulty that um, will be inherited in that process because you have the FIFA statute also preventing litigation of court matters, of football matters in court. So if I, I, it, 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 it may be a little bit futile seeking to cure it by provision of access to the court of Ghana, and at the same time to have FIFA also restricting the uh, um, um, litigation of, of football matters in, in, in a court of law. So now we, we seem to be a little bit restricted to matters whereby there has been a violation of natural justice and whatever you, before a person can go to court. But I think that the whole thing has to be looked at again. I think um, we've had enough. Now, leader, this one you will be very brief. That's a horrible question. Chairman, we go and agree on something, and we come here. Chairman, Chairman, I'll be very brief with uh, Odame, so my senior colleague at the bar, who also have had some uh, working relationship with the nominee when he set up his, you don't want me to call it public, and there are instances where you seldom will ask why this became part. We need to avoid a recurrence walking back to judgment debt. And we all must be mindful what that means for public resources in, uh, in terms of avoiding those things. I know that government has a policy decision to review contracts. It's within government's uh, uh, power to do that. But in accordance with law and with respect for law, mindful of what its consequences may mean financially. I think that uh, I, I, you are my contemporary in Legon. And uh, uh, when I say contemporary, he understands. He was smaller, you know, even as you look at him. I've refused to have a beard. He was younger. His con my contemporary is Ben C, which is one of his best uh, friends, and my colleague at law school who have accompanied him. So we trust that you will assist the Attorney General in a fair, impartial manner to disperse justice supported by the judicial organ. Uh, suffice it to say, yesterday I said the chairman, so I'm ending. The judiciary and the relationship, even though we respect the separation of powers, there are very urgent issues that sometimes the minister have to refer that to you, the minister, like state attorneys, still have issues of their pensions unresolved. Daily, it becomes an issue that you need to assist your minister to uh, 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 resolve. And even the conditions of service of the attorney general, uh, uh, men uh, working at the attorney general office and by extension to the judicial council is also a matter you probably will uh, assist your minister. Uh, as for football, any judgment you people have given a disciplinary committee in our rooms, we curse the sports disciplinary committee because of the continuous unfairness in the judgment. So I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ordinarily, this should be the end because the uh, Chief Whip and the Vice are not keen on answering, asking questions. But the Minority Chief we just came in and asked for two. So I'll allow him two questions. I thought we agreed that two, not exceeding three. You requested to add Yes, uh, colleague, congrats. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not referring to. Uh, Colleague being a lawyer, uh, very soon you also join the wagon of politicians. <laughs> are you are you a card bearing member of MPP? Such a man, indeed I am. I've been so for quite a reasonable period of time now. Since when? Oh, you don't remember? Since exactly. about 2007. From right. Oh, okay. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to find out whether, as a legal practitioner, going to court, the delay in the delivery of justice. You know, there's this saying that people are saying that justice delayed is justice denied. 
I know sometimes you may say it's not deliberate from the judge, but it takes so long for one case to get heard. I'm reliable and to told that in South Africa, a judge picks a case until you are done with it, you are not given another case. I don't know how true that is. But going to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General to assist the minister, what do you hope with your own experience in court to support your minister to be able to get the justice system to move a little faster? Well, first and foremost, there has been already initiated what they call legal um, sector and justice reform program. Now, that actually was pursuant to a baseline survey that was conducted um, of the public with regards to the attainment of their impressions of a justice legal system. And one major problem that came up was the lack of speed with regards to the adjudication of cases in court, then also lack of transparency. Now, the justice, the legal system justice reform program itself is still in, in, in progress. Um, the Honorable Atenjura indeed had um, briefed me about it about a month ago, and she's actually very keen to ensuring the execution of that project. And it has to do also with making sure that there's inter-institutional collaboration. So there's collaboration between the police, the um, prisons, the judiciary, sharing of information and what have you. I think also that there has to be a reform of the rules, especially the Supreme Court rules. I, for one, do not understand why every matter that the person, a person files in the Supreme Court has to be heard by a panel of Supreme Court judges. If in the United States of America, yes, you find the Supreme Court itself vetting the cases that will be heard by the court. Now, our Supreme Court, there's even a greater imperative for that to be done because our Supreme Court has a number of jurisdictions, has original jurisdiction, the appellate jurisdiction, the review jurisdiction, the supervisory jurisdiction, and of course we have the um, election petition jurisdiction as well. So combining five jurisdictions in one court and for the court to also hear every matter that is filed because the person has the right of appeal is improper. I think that even though the constitution grants to a person who has lost a case at the high court, where the matter was commenced at the high court, a right of appeal to the Supreme Court, there should be a mechanism, a reform of the a rules of the Supreme Court whereby the Supreme Court itself will vet the cases and decide if there is any matter of significance to be, um, to be dealt with in the matter, in the case, then it will go on for hearing. So that if, the, if, if no major principle will come up for determination in that case or if no fresh principle will be established through a hearing of that case, then the case will not be heard at all. That is a way of reducing the burden on the Supreme Court. Sometimes it's a little bit with all respect, nauseating. We go to Supreme Court, we are waiting for a hearing of a major constitutional matter, and you find a full panel hearing a very small matter which involves no complex issue of law or which involves no new or novel matter for consideration by the Supreme Court. That is one. And I think at the High Court level too, yes, it has to be a way of also um, looking at the rules again reforming it by way of ensuring a much speedy determination of it. There has already been instituted the um, practice of filing of witness statements, which clearly has enhanced the speed with which matters are being, are being heard. But of course, there's more to be done. And indeed, that's the biggest problem of every litigant in Ghana, speed of the justice delivery system. So that is a matter that if I'm permitted to assist the Honorable Attenjura, we'll be looking at. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And my last one, legal aid. Now, because of the struggle to put the body and soul together, every lawyer is like, I have to get money. And legal aid services, that used to be a very useful service for the very needy within our society, it's still there, but we all admit, I mean, it's just going down and down and down. As a legal practitioner yourself, knowing that a number of times you've done pro bono for others, what advice will you take to the ministry, together with your minister, to once again strengthen legal aid so that 
the, the needy and desperate ones among us who cannot afford legal service can always avail themselves to the services of the legal aid board. The challenges that are faced by the legal aid scheme to me are very sad. They're very sad because legal aid has a constitutional basis. Article 294, clause 1, enjoins um, legal aid, and that is why there was a legal aid scheme act enacted by this honorable house. But of course, the main problem facing the legal aid is the lack of lawyers. And the lack of lawyers clearly has to do with the remuneration and the mechanism for remuneration of lawyers who decide to do legal aid. It is also important to note that if you go to the legal aid board, legal aid office itself, the number of lawyers who actually are there, I mean, so insignificant. And clearly they cannot take on all the challenges that um, persons who apply for legal aid um, um, bring. And it's very um, sad because we live in a very poor country. It's, it's a developing country. And for that matter, the number of persons who may want to assess justice, even though they cannot afford the cost of justice, is very much high. So legal aid, yes, is something that if I'm... Um, if this one because he shortly approves my nomination, we'll be looking at. Uh, he says he can't hear you. Oh, he can't hear. Yes, I, I made a point that legal aid itself. No, no, I'm, 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 oh, the last yes. video we're talking about. Oh, very well. So, so I'm saying that it is, it is, it is a scheme that really has to be looked at, and I, in in the role of of assistance to the attorney general, will be clearly looking at it. And it's something that's of concern to me. I myself have done a number of pro bono cases. I've done many human rights matters. And the cases that actually bring emotional satisfaction to me are the cases where you find the rights of, of a very poor person somewhere uh, being violated. And I succeed in defending that person. Those cases are actually ones that are of, of immense importance to me. It is not all those big constitutional cases that I have done. It is those small, small matters that really bring emotional satisfaction to me. So we'll be looking at legal aid. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Mr. Um, um, I haven't heard exactly what he'll be doing. He has just reiterated yeah. the same concern that I have. I know that we'll look at it. I thought that you were going to be one that. or two strategies yeah. that you and uh, you'll be giving the minister to enhance the legal aid. Thank you. Your concerns are noted. He's now sitting outside looking in. When he join in, then he will see the appropriate privileges he can. Now, we shall acknowledge those who accompanied the nominee. <laughs> nominee. <laughs> yes. Mr. Chairman or Sevanda? No, you address Very the much. chair. Ignore all comments. Mr. Chairman. Vandals are always gentlemen, so that's acknowledged. Please, I mean, what, what, what do I look? What don't I look like a gentleman? And I was there. Uh, I, I was not, not only was I a president, I was also a choir master, but I'm still a gentleman. Yeah. VV Alliance and the Waltarians are here as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> the following person.